until we're just beginning. Um, and what I was about to do was give a little backstory to how Michael and I got involved in updating the Atlas from 1990. So the Acadian Hair was something that we were involved with. And that was a survey that we did statewide looking for this butterfly that seems to have been in decline. Um, and we were working with Natural Heritage, the state program. Um, that survey wrapped up a couple of years ago. We wrote up a proposal to Heritage. And my understanding is this month, the Secretary of State is supposed to sign off on the new species list for protected species in Massachusetts. And the Acadian industry will be on that list. So it will be added as a threatened species to the natural heritage list. So we were looking for a new project um, and a reason to want to get out into the field. And I guess I need this so I can. So I don't know how many of you recognize this person, but that's what we do out in the field. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit more um, a bit more serious about this um, a number of the butterflies in the state seem to be declining and as we were trying to figure out what it is that we wanted to do we went through a number of species and said well maybe we should study this species or that species and none of them really felt like the thing that would really motivate us. And so, you know, we've got things like the common roadside skipper, which um, is disappearing from the state if it hasn't already disappeared. Um, Harris checker spot um, definitely seems to be disappearing from a lot of its traditional locations. Um, Great Spangled Fridlary, Fridlaries um, certainly seem to have declined in the eastern part of the state as well. And so as we were kind of thrashing around trying to come up with something that would motivate us to get out in the field and maybe others, we got in touch with uh, Mr. Small right here. Um, so this is his fault. <laughs> I want to be on the state of the so he said, well, why don't you guys? So um, it's been a long time since the Atlas has been updated. And Michael kind of went, really? You want to do that? Yes. No. And so, got signed. Mm -hmm. So, a little bit about the Atlas. Um, so, I don't know, how many of you know about the Massachusetts Butterfly Atlas? Mm -hmm. no, not too bad. No, mm -hmm. So, it's published online. Um, it's the URL. Um, it has, I don't know, more than 110 species up there, not all of which they found, and some of which you still won't find. Um, there are currently about 109 species that I think you can still find in Massachusetts, 110 with the roadside skipper, which I don't think you can still find. So it was a field survey. Um, Dave tells me that it actually started in 84. But the stuff online says 86, well, ran to 1990. Tom, you were part of that as well, weren't you? Yeah, it started in 87. I don't think it was the first year that I started. I can tell you, I, I, I tell you I started it, if you want to know. Go ahead. Uh, I, I was, the all, all preliminary stuff was done in 1985. Uh, the field work was done in 1986 to 1990, and plus one additional year of field work. So the, the project started in 1985 and went to 1991, actually. Thank you. You're welcome. So something that's kind of interesting about it is historically, it was the first um, systematic survey, statewide survey of butterflies as far as I can find out, in North America. 
and has been used as a model for state butterfly surveys, even as recently as several years ago. Um, and so it was kind of a seminal project in that regard. Um, Vermont has done studies, Connecticut has done an atlas which was modeled after this, Maine has done an atlas which was modeled after this kind of work as well. Done by volunteers, so it's a form of citizen science. And the people involved in it, um, and the people who are probably this, this, are pretty excited. Um, so when the survey ended, um, they were kind of like I am, looking for something to continue. And in 1991, okay, they established something called the Massachusetts Butterfly Club. So this is the club's history. Um, the club um, does most walks, always in wonderful conditions for find the butterflies. Um, they protect novices, aggressive butterflies, by beating them back the stick. Um, and they have a website uh, with some very useful information, as we heard earlier. It's used by folks all over the country. Um, and it has, again, more than 110 species, all of which are found in Massachusetts and a few that yeah, maybe we're seeing the most. Um, has photographs of the various butterflies and more recently, they have published um, flight charts. So as has been said before, all of the sightings from NASLIP and the Facebook page get recorded in the database. That database now has 34 years of sightings information. In 2014, Derek Nielsen, who is a member of the club, developed uh, flight charts and published those, and that's online at the club site. And we start looking. In the early 2010s, about the same time that Eric was figuring out the flight you know, charts, um, there was other analysis done of the data in the database. Um, some of you may remember Sharon Stichter, member. She and Elizabeth Crown, who was a professor at Tufts, I believe, um, and Greg Breed, who was either a graduate student or postgrad, um, did work at Harvard. Um, they analyzed that database. Sharon published a bunch of species accounts um, and some distribution maps associated with each species, and they published a paper. Um, and that paper is referenced um, having to do with impacts of climate change um, on natural history. Since that time, um, things have continued to change. And that change may be accelerating. So these are the USDA plant organic cells. And you can see here that about 10 years ago, a little more, a lot of Massachusetts and Northern England was in what a later called the Canadian zone. It's a cooler climate zone. Um, and this area here is in what we think of Massachusetts as in the transition zone, the transition between warmer and more southern zone and then northern Canadian. In a mere 10 years, you can see that that's receded. Yeah. Well, this zones in a little bit of the state. And what used to be about half of the state is now a little bit of northern and northeast corner of the state. 
and most of the state is approximately five degrees warmer on average than it was a decade ago. And so when you think about climate changing in geologic time, there's something a little strange about that. It's So this was from a recent article um, by an AP reporter. Um, so according to Noah, the last winter was the warmest on record in 103 years, which I think is about as long as we've been recording um, like the state of Massachusetts. We're talking about five degrees on average. Z out just about four weeks earlier than it was and I'm sure that Folks that pay attention to birds are aware of this. Um, and this things. So, you know, when it comes to pollinators and birds, plants are triggered by temperature. The birds migrate northward based on daylight. And so you have leaf out in the oaks. The oaks flowering. The insects aren't necessarily showing them. Um, and the caterpillars start eating the new growth. And the birds, which typically are time to show up eat the caterpillars, arrive a couple of weeks later. In addition, there was a recent study in Europe that shows that there are flowering plants that are insect pollinated that are becoming wind pollinated. They're giving up the needs. And that was particularly tension with them. Um, so the other thing is, you know, pests, parasites, disease, um, all probably favors the kinds of springs that we're now having, wet, somewhat cooler and stuff. Um, and that is going to impact um, overwintering caterpillars in particular. Now, it's particularly taken by the um, U.S. no longer has four seasons, which is the summer and November. So they're all very fun in November. So to translate this into butterfly terms, these are lifestyle maps um, that basically come from, I think it was the refresh for the Peterson Guide, by Oppler, and I'm trying to pronounce his name, he was the illustrator. And so you can see here the lifestyles that I was talking about. Here's Massachusetts, and here's the Northern Zone. And like I said, well, it's bigger and easier on us. So this is the Canadian Zone, which extended all the way down into Connecticut. Um, this was back in 2000. This is transition zone, you know, towards the coast, a little warmer, lower elevation. I'd be able to put money on the fact that this transition, this Canadian zone, doesn't extend down to the coast in Connecticut anymore. Mm -hmm. And we know that this is received a corner is much smaller in Massachusetts. So getting one back to the big picture. We have some butterflies that are retreating northward. The Paris Checker spot would appear to be one of those. Um, and, spread. and we have other butterflies that have invaded from the south, um, including this guy, who wasn't really in Massachusetts to speak of years ago, and certainly wasn't here year after year. Um, and in the last few years, it appears that that butterfly may have been overwintering even farther north in Massachusetts with the Connecticut River Valley. So as we contemplate um, updating the atlas, the change in climate and butterfly movements isn't the only thing that's changing. Um, this is a very recently published phylogeny for butterflies, not just in Massachusetts. And this is based on genetics. And 
in addition to the genetics, they had 11 fossils from butterflies that they could anchor at different genetic points and when the genetics branch out when um, you get speciation, that they could anchor in time with this. Um, and based on this way of looking at the taxonomy, they estimate that there's 36 different tribes of butterflies that need to be reclassified in the family tree for butterflies. And most of that's not going to affect Massachusetts butterflies, but there are a couple already um, that are being reclassified. So also in that paper is an interesting, at least I find it interesting to the question. And that is, so butterflies first emerged um, based on the fossil record somewhere in the Cretaceous, um, and this starts about 100 million years ago. And they first showed up basically here, um, southwest Massachusetts, northern Massachusetts. Um, and you know, they spread across the America, north and south American continent, Central America. And from there, they moved across, well, we think of it as the Antarctic continent. Um, and showed up all the way here in what has become Australia. Walked across the Bering Strait Bridge um, and showed up along the Asian continent, where they basically stayed along the coast. Um, whereas here they invaded the interior as well. From there, they moved to the interior in Asia, um, but not across the areas, and started to move to the Indian subcontinent, which, by the way, was not connected by land. It was still isolated in the ocean at that time, so they crossed the sea. And, you know, they ran down the African coast here. Um, they continue to sort of ex populate and expand. They're particularly fond of the uh, South American tropics, as we'll discuss. Um, here they continue basically to expand the number of species and populations. You see the tropics becoming the real hotspot in the world for a number of species and population densities. And finally, they moved into Europe and North Africa, which is where we find it today. And Europe has the least number of butterfly species of any one of the world, and some of the famous populations. Thanks. Um, so, say probably about 15 years ago, when I started taking higher resolution pictures of butterflies, I discovered, well, like people 35 years before me, that some butterflies have little hairs in their eyes. Um, as we all know, they have compound eyes. The eyelids are packed together basically like a honeycomb or hexagonal. And in each of the vertices of the hex hexagons is one of these little hairs. To know. And when I first discovered this, I went and read everything I could to try to find out what was the function of these little hairs. Nobody knew. Lots of theories and speculation, and nobody really knew. In 2015, some guys actually modeled those eyes and hairs in a wind tunnel and discovered that those little hairs create basically a stagnant air buffer in the air. The eyes. So when the butterfly is flying, pollen and dust can't get in their eyes and obscure the vision. So at least now we're in one function. And the reason to have them. Not all butterflies have them. Um, a lot of the, the elfers, the elfins, the gossamer wings, um, some of the brushwoods have them. But a lot of butterflies don't have them.
Who can identify this butterfly for me? Oh, don't be shy. Try to hold it. No. All right. Now, can we So, this is one of our fairly common local butterflies. Um, and I recently learned. So we all know that butterflies taste with their feet, right? Yeah. Okay. Did you know that they have ears and their wings? Yes. Very good for you. <laughs> Did you know that Saturnids, like our common witness, also has a hearing aid? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let me zoom in just a little bit more here. So here's the ear. This is the equivalent of an eardrum. It is an air-filled sac. This is like our inner ear. It translates the vibrations into signals that get transmitted to the little mushroom body that serves as the brain in these things. And this is an enlarged vein. So I think we all know that butterfly wings are basically stiff membranes um, with veins that run through them. The veins are basically pumped. So when the butterfly first it closes, the wings are not expanded. The butterfly pumps body fluid up through those veins, right? Expands the wings. And then that body fluid is goes back into the body. And the veins and the wings harden and the veins are all hollow. This enlarged vein which is, as far as I know, fairly unique to Saturnus, um, is hollow and it acts kind of like an echo chamber. So it picks up the sound and channels the sound right down to basically the ear. Mm -hmm. Enough of that. Back to the project. So, Project, we're going to update the species accounts. Um, you know, in 30 years, we've learned some things we didn't know. So there is new information to be found in, on the more of the species accounts. Um, things like the ears, for example. Um, I'm not sure that we knew that's relatively new information that a professor has been studying in Calgary, some graduate students. There will be new photography. Um, our goal is to basically have dorsal and ventral, male and female and appropriate, um, and maybe some other interesting uh, photographs as well. Um, we're gonna actually have something that distinguishes similar species and how they them apart and separate that out from the identification section, um, which I haven't found to be the case in many of the current references. They tend to smush that stuff together or just ignore the similar species stuff. Um, we're going to update the float charts on um, distribution maps. And the real interesting stuff is we want to look at trends. In particular, what's happened since 2014 to now. Because things seem to be changing very quickly. Normally, you think a 10 year span is not worth the trouble. But you see some fairly dramatic changes in Massachusetts at this point during that period of time. As I'm sure the recent mild winters will test for everybody. An example of a, an account. I think we all know what this is. Um, so there's an identification section, like I said, similar species, range and distribution. Um, eventually, there'll be a map is a mighty more than one associated with where you find it in Massachusetts, um, also the status of the state. We'll do a slight chart. We haven't done any of this analysis yet, but it's for TVD. Larval food plants, um, adult food plants, when it's reasonable, um, a general description associated with habitat where you might find it. Thank you. We have information about the life cycle stages um, which for all butterflies in Massachusetts, which again, I'm not sure that we had all that information. 
in 30 years ago, we've done some stuff. David Black and other few colleagues have been very active with regards to life stages. Um, and when appropriate, um, some notes, sometimes behavioral notes. In this particular case, there's a paragraph that talks about the mimicry stuff that we're off with. And I said that there'll be some photographs. Um, so these are some examples of things that one might find. Everybody recognizes the first thing, so I'm getting in it. That's an example of what I'm trying. Who's carefully uses diapause to get from you? Yes, sir. I got two of them. So I might have thought that this is just something like an iron type. Yeah. Thank you for playing. Um, I really want to encourage everybody, please get out in the field for the next couple of years. Go to places that you like to go. Go to places that you're not familiar with. Report everything you find. Go to some town you've never been in, and if you see a Catholic white, report it because it gets into the database. And it will affect our statistics with regards to coverage and observer. Yeah. So one of the things that we're going to have to analyze is where do people go, where don't they go, what are they seeing, to try to figure out how that's affecting the data that we have at our distribution maps and our knowledge development other things. So please get out, do what you normally do, maybe do a little bit more, and report it the way you normally report it, because that'll get into the database. And that's the database that we're going to use. And we want data analysis for distribution maps, trends, and flight charts. And just to get the heck of it, and here's the other map. By the way, that previous map, which shows places that people go and where they don't go, to figure out how, which I can't. Um, so the white home tabs in the map are places that we don't have any records from. And the previous map was over 30 years. So it's like we don't have any records at all in those towns. Um, if you're wondering what the towns are for this, um, in your journal will be a short article with that map. And it will tell you how to find on a state um, website a PDF of that same map with all the towns labeled. So you can look that up. Um, we did this just because we were interested in the fun. This is basically the number of different species by town that we find. So species diversity. And you can see this town over here tends to be really popular. Anybody want to guess as to what that town is? Bingo. Oh, right. So why would Northampton be particularly diverse? Go ahead. We have a beautiful community garden. Yeah, that's not it. That's um, one. Tom <laughs> no, is one. Day. So Northampton has some, some local folks that go out across the year. It does have the community garden where a lot of people go at particular times of the year. But even more significantly, it is on the edge of this area and on the edge of this area. So it gets both the eastern and the western butterflies, at least the ones that are moving around. And furthermore, it is in the Connecticut River Valley, which is a migration path. And things show up in Northampton that don't show up anywhere else in the state because they've come in or blown in on a storm from the south. So, um, we'll see. This stuff is really very similar, and we haven't really done a lot of analysis. So, I go around and talk after this. So, at some point, you know, we'll be prepared to sort of actually publish information in some form of fashion. This stuff was a scramble that just got done. 
little farther on, you'll see some stuff about uh, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I used to work with the Audubon kids, and Hitchcock said are these places that work with children. Oh. Now, uh, are you volunteering? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking that young eyes and young legs tell them what you want and tell them what to find with the camera. Um, yeah, so I do know Martha at this Audubon site. Um, I know that the different sites have sort of different personnel and they do different things. Um, Martha does work with some um, uh, young people and they do go out with cameras and stuff. I don't know if they're there, but I can talk to her um, and find out more about what's practical and then we're going to thanks. No suggestion. I know you had something. The previous map by which the worst of the lighter color that they said they had like no observations of their view. Do you have a list of those towns that way we can try to explore them a little more or can help you create that? Um Michael might be able to do that, but also if you just download um the map from the state website that has the town names, you can okay. easily. I used to say that map from my report too, so you guys learn in Photoshop. Yeah. Okay, so now for the fun part, now that I've bored you all to death. Time to wait. I can make this work. Okay. Um, <laughs> right, so, so I'm, I'm Michael, and you might be wondering why I'm up here talking to the Butterfly Club about um, about this project. Um, and basically, um, um, a while back, I don't know if I need it, but okay. Um, a while back, maybe six, seven years ago, I was the photo editor for the club and I worked on updating the website and noticed that, you know, um, there were some new species in, in the, that were being reported that weren't on the website. Um, and that the flight charts, for example, didn't have the spring brood for Zyberlon, Skip, or Ripon, and Air Street on them because. They were they didn't exist in 2014 when the flight charts were last updated. And so I was sort of, you know, thinking about that already. And then and then Gary sort of um, talked to me about having a new project and getting some club engagement here. And uh, yeah, I got roped into doing an Atlas update with him. Um, and in particular, um, Gary wanted me to talk about or not, not, not talk about, but the process data and um, and do like flight, flight distribution charts, um, flight time charts, and distribution charts. And in particular, um, when I'm not photographing butterflies, I'm a software developer. I program. I download MATLAB Home Edition and pulled up the GIS files for the state and put them all together and combine that with the club database to make a bunch of plots. Um, and here's sort of an example of one of the plots, but first about these maps. So there's a bunch of caveats for using this club data and the maps I generated. Um, first is that the data, it hasn't been cleaned at all, or it hasn't been uh, um, at all like um, <clears throat> altered. Like basically um, some species can get misreported. There might be misidentified stuff in there. Um, every now and then you'll see, you know, uh, there'll be like, one observation way over here that doesn't make sense. And we didn't do anything with that. It's just as is. Um, but observations, um, they would also be, they're, they're also inconsistent in the club. Uh, like the, the club members change over time. They have different skill levels, different um, observation practices. Uh, and so uh, the data going into this uh, club database, it, it varies. Um, also you have uh, that people don't go to the same places year over year. And so, what might show up as a gap in the data, it's just no one went there. Um, and then you also have, um, for example, um, some, some places people go to all the time. And there's some species that are very showy that people will look for and report. But if someone sees a cabbage white, they probably won't. And so you have these biases in the data as well. Um, additionally, um, you know, if you wanted to do statistics in this data, you'd want them to be independent observations. But they're not, you know, like a, and you'll see a company tortoise shell and mouse standish, and the next day I'll be there looking for it. And so we'll, we'll both report it. And, you know, it's, it's not an independent observation, but that's that's in the data. 
Um, I also couldn't plot the July count data. Um, all those aren't by town. And I did not like to implement 10 mile radiuses or counties or anything. Uh, this is just what, it, what was reported at a town level. Um, and then lastly, um, in the early years of the club and the database, there are very few reports. Um, it was just getting started. And so in the first couple of years, we'll see mostly a couple observations centered around Worcester and it slowly builds up from there. Uh, Okay. And now I want to pull up a different app and share it. Can you go to share the data? How do I share this? Back here, Brian said, "We can't see." Go get him, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. That's not the one I want. I'm not sure. We, we have the presenters. We have the presenters' view on the last presentations oh, okay hang on a minute everybody stay calm <laughs> let's see Oops, where'd it go these things are squirrely that was great before i get to it down there Mm -hmm. hmm. Oh, great. Are we not on Zoom anymore? We're there. I see people. Yeah, we're hearing you. Oh, that's good. That's good. It doesn't help me at all, but it's good. <laughs> Where'd it go? Oh, I want to do that. And the sound isn't breaking up anymore. That's good. Oh. <laughs> Man. Michael, do you want to answer a question in the meantime? Uh, sure. Okay, so this is the question. Uh, it seems to me like this is a, a case of apples and oranges that the original Atlas project was done using 186 USGS quad maps, and you're using the, the towns of Massachusetts, which is a completely different thing. And it's great that you're trying to update the information, but it doesn't seem like an update of the Atlas if you're using a completely different map base. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly it seems right. like an update of the Massachusetts butterfly. <laughs> Not the atlas. Yeah, it's it's an a data update, and it's refined to town rather than the way the original one did it. I mean, it's different, but it also has thirty four years more data uh, to put into it. So hopefully, there's some value in that. <laughs> you there's a lot of value in it. You, you, you don't. No you apples don't. are down. It's not the same thing. Yeah, but you don't lose the data for the first atlas. It's still there. Well, okay. Right. So what were the lines, Brian, on the first atlas? How did you divide it up? We used the, the USGS topographic maps, 186 covered eight. And within each topographic map, there were six quads. And so okay. you, your assignment was to go into one of the quads and find uh, as many species of butterflies as you can. And then within that quad, um, designate which, which one of the six sections you were in. Yeah, I guess I remember Barbara telling me about that, Barbara. So that's about, that's, 
So we yeah. had 351 towns in Massachusetts, and we had 1,100 different places where you could find butterflies on the original atlas. Okay. Thank you. Which is a lot more than 351. Yep. But it doesn't work unless you have the maps in front of you. Oh, if I lose anybody, just sign back in, okay? Because you okay. never know what's going to happen. Good luck. Yeah, I'm, I'm out of my league already. Hard to believe. <laughs> it's all these youngsters. I got all these weird programs I want to run. Mike, Mike's younger. He has new, new program ideas, right? Yeah. Ah, I think I'm back. Yeah, there we go. Good. All right, where do you want to go? You wanted that map, right? Yeah. Nice. Okay, we're getting there. We're getting there. How do you make that bigger? Meadow, Friddle on Buzzards Bay. Wow. And that's exactly the point of this map, in fact. Can you see that? Yeah, yep. I don't know. Oh, you guys want everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where'd that go? Um, hmm. Oh, that was working great just a minute ago. All right, well, where the heck would that be? That's in and that's in. Be a series of butterflies of <laughs> <laughs> well, I can see it pretty well. So. I can see it pretty well on. Okay, hang on a minute. We're going to. Why is my projector working now, though? That's a whole different issue. So. Um... I wonder if we just unplug it and plug it back in and be able to yeah, maybe we'll find it. Yeah. Let's do that. Let it there we go. It's... Yeah. MEFR. Didn't do anything, huh? Thanks for checking. Well. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, there's a thing up here. Mike, up here, up here, can you see whether it has like the sharing, you know, multiple screens of the function on the top row? I can't read any of that. The function and then the. Uh, oh, what is the MEFR stand for? In the title. MEFR, oh, metal fritillary, I see. Yeah. Object, yeah. extend, I want to duplicate. Duplicate. There we go. Got it. Okay. Oh, what, what happened? Yeah, where did it go? <laughs> the window's gone. It all tap, no, that's the presentation still. I don't want that. I want this window. Okay. All right. Can everyone see it? Okay. All right. Um, so what I have here is basically um, you're going to see a series of uh, 
of plots of butterflies in the state, but done by town. Um, and um, sample meadow fritillary, as Brian pointed out, um, there's one observed in Buzzard's Bay, which may or may not actually be true. Um, I think in particular, this butterfly could be misidentified as either a silver border or a pearl crescent or something. And, but it's an example of some of the stuff we see in the data that you might have some questions. How are we going to address those? Um, I don't have an answer for you. <clears throat> okay, so you have four, four records, at least four records of meadow fritillary in southeastern Massachusetts, where I don't, I, I don't know. I, you, it seems like you might take those four records and see if anybody had a photo or uh, even a specimen. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, there's going to be um, a lot of this, <laughs> um, but but yeah, um, I would agree with you 100%. Um, all right, so on to the next one. Um, so here we have the um, a cabbage white, um, an example of a super interesting butterfly. Um, this particular one, it's, it's abundant, it's everywhere, it's ubiquitous, and um, darker colors here mean there are more of them. Um, and it's sort of animating year over year, kind of like a five-year smooth sort of animation. Um, but the point of this is where there's white squares, I'm assuming that we're not observing there as opposed to the butterfly isn't there. So that you can view this as like a baseline of where the club observes butterflies. Um, so just uh, one way to sort of view that bias in the data is uh, this, this, this map. Can I ask a question? Sorry to interrupt. Sure, go for it. All right, but it's cabbage white, and a lot of people don't even report cabbage white because, like you say, that's a Yeah, um, that's exactly right. Um, fun side note, your morning club from Situate would be the first record from Situate we have in our database. Um, uh, if you wanted to report it, just... <laughs> I, I, I do report this. You can ask Mark Fair, but I report. Okay. So let me ask, when you say reported, are you talking about the club's databases or are there other sources um, of data that so, you intend to use or asking us to use? So this is this, this is just pulled from the club database, um, which Mark Fairbrother compiles for us. He does a fantastic job with that. Um, thanks again, Mark, for um, all the effort you do there. Um, but he compiles it from MassLab and from the Facebook group. And people also just send him spreadsheets and he inputs it that way. So you're not using uh, iNaturalist or nope. any other butterfly? Nope, not iNaturalist, not eButterfly, not, 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 not any of those. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so this next one is Common Roadside Skipper. Um, and um, this is a butterfly that um, I think is, um, it's very hard to find in Massachusetts now. Um, it used to be visible in a couple places, and then it's not. I don't know if you can see the years there, but uh, but after 2011-2012. It's, it's somewhat challenging to ID. Yeah, but it also just, uh, this is an example of one that's probably not with us anymore, or it's hard to find. Let's see what's next. Um, this is sort of a follow-up to uh, um, Gary's project for the Acadian Hair Street. Um, and uh, let's sort of just watch how this distribution moves. So this doesn't have the 4th of July count data. Um, this does not have 4th of July count data. Um, And toward the end here, there's there's two spots where two spots where we know we're seeing the past five years there. Um, here's a dreamy dusty wing, um, which is just um, another example of a uh, of it potentially declining toward the end. Um, no idea why that might be, if it's observational or if it's actually the butterfly is uh, not as common. Yeah. 
might be the uh, butterfly or is our aging well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That also could be true. I mean, there's definitely different, different observers. Um, okay. Wow. Look at that. Dreamy, dusty one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, there you go. All right, so now we got European skipper. Um, the first thing I'll note is uh, when you see them, you see them. That's why you have all the very dark colors on the <laughs> on the display. Um, and and what we have here is sort of an example of a, butter, of a butterfly that like uh, came into the area was very common, very abundant, and then toward the end, sort of. It's still it's still a, a common, but it's not in as big a numbers. Um, it's sort of flattened out um, more recently. Yep. Mm. Well, it certainly has. I remember writing back in 1990 that the European skipper during its flight period was more common in Massachusetts than all other butterflies combined. It did go through. Yeah, I, I can believe it. <laughs> Amazing. Decrease. Yeah. The population. Let's see. Amazing. All right. Now here's um, the silvery blue. Um, like at the start of the club data, it was sort of infiltrating from the north into the state. And as you watch it, it very slowly and subtly moves south throughout the course of the 30 years. So uh, you'll find it in more southern areas as time goes on. <clears throat> In all of these reports, it's butterfly reports, not caterpillar reports, correct? I think, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I think it is butterfly reports, but I don't know what Mark does with caterpillars. Um, yeah. I mean, certainly 95% of the reports at least are just butterflies. Uh, okay. Now, the fiery skipper, um, this is one of uh, several southern invaders. Um, this one in particular wasn't in the state for a while and then started coming in from the south. And uh, it had a little bit of a dive back there and then it comes back again. Hmm. Um, yeah, this one in particular, um, 2013 seemed to be a bad year for a lot of butterflies. Um, and a lot of them, um, there's at least 10 species I, I saw on Bugle with this data that had a big drop in 2013 and then came back. Um, no idea why that is. Okay, uh, a sachem, uh, another one that when we started the atlas was not in the state. And when we finished the atlas, it wasn't in the state either, my friend. Oh. <laughs> um, it was first found by Paul Miliotis out at uh, World's End Reservation <laughs> after the atlas was over. Um, as you see with Sachem here, um, it seems very fond of the ocean and has invaded along the southeast coast and then up the coast toward the northeast of the state, and um, particularly tied to water. Or, and coastal areas. Wow. All right. Um, as here's the Zebulon skipper. Um, again, not found early on. Um, this one um, started in the Connecticut River Valley and had a nice, brief little uh, um, introduction to the state. There it was only found there. Then a few years later, started on the, on the southeast coast, and then just exploded. And again, it popped back um, 2013, 2014, and then explodes again. Yeah. Okay, I got, I think, one more example of an invader. So here's the giant swallowtail. This is going to be over the course of, uh, of seven years. Um, it started in the southwest of the state, and now it's everywhere. Um, it just uh, almost instantaneously just was statewide now. Um, One record during the atmosphere. 
Okay. Um, so this one, great spangled fritillary. Um, it's mainly notable because it seems to be retreating in the east. Um, I mean, you, you see, there's a bunch of records sort of, you know, in and around Boston now. Um, and then toward the end, uh, there won't be nearly as many. Yeah. Um, no idea if that's a why the eastward retreat or if that's what that is, but uh, the data looks interesting. Is uh, all I have to say on that one. Okay. Um, yeah, here's the common study wing. Uh, you can really see like that that discovery phase at the beginning where we only had a couple um, observations around the Worcester area. Um, Yeah, and then by the end here, this one just seems to be declining. It's it's hard to say what's going on, but uh, very few of them in the past couple of years. Uh, we've only got like five or six more of these, so uh, let's, keep, let's keep going. Um, Okay, so Milbert's tortoise shell. This is an example of a, a butterfly that does big boom and big bust cycles. Like you won't see them, and then you'll see a whole lot, and then you'll see none again. Um, we got a few of those, um, but they'll be gone. They'll be here. Not one in my yard once. Yeah, and just because you saw it in one town one year doesn't mean you'll see it there the next year. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. Um, but unlike the most of the other ones, I, I don't think this is a decline. They're just, they're variable. They, they come in numbers and then they, they go away. Um, I, I don't know. Like southern migrants, except northern migrants, they migrate south into the state a little bit and different years, different numbers. I think that might be, yeah, that's. That might be right. That's um, yeah. Red Emerald's another example. This one is a um, it's a resident. It overwinters here, but it also has large flights um, in and along the coast. And it is very erratic. You'll see large numbers and then none. Did you just say it's resident. I mean, it, it overwinters um, as opposed to some of the other ones later that don't. I I didn't know that it opened. You sure? You sure? Over inches? Yeah. Okay. Um, painted ladies, uh, more of the same. Where um, incredibly variable numbers. So this one. Uh, that's an overwinter in the state. It tends to migrate in from the south or west uh, every every year. Michael, is this over the number of sightings? Or... Um, so, so the colors there, um, they're um, it's number of individuals, um, but this one is yearly, so it's individuals. Um, the different color grades are like a less than two, and less than five, and less than ten, and more than that. Yes, yeah, so I reported five today, five tomorrow, five the next day. Is that fifteen? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. That? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, it's just adding them together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So this is um, the Eastern Com. I guess the last like seven or eight years. I don't know if anyone remembers. They were really hard to find in 2021. Um, I guess uh, sort of fell off a cliff there, and then uh, <laughs> still kind of rare. But this spring seems to be good for them. Um, let's see. 
Um, and here's just a static Mac. This is um, the Oak Hair Street. Um, all 34 years of club data put together. And you know, it's actually seen in a fair number of towns uh, throughout the state. Um, um, based on their habits of being very hard to find and um, hard to report. Uh, um, this might speak to maybe delisting them was, was the right idea. Um, just a thought there. Let's see, and then last, um, this chart um, is red spot of purple and white admiral all smushed together. Um, the red is red spot of purple, blue is white admiral, and then purple is um, both of them and the ratio of it determines how much red or blue is in it. Um, so as you can see on the southeast coast, there's uh, um, just red spot of purples so, with you know the stray white admiral in there every every, every so often. Um, opposite corner of the map, uh, uh, you have almost equal numbers of white admirals and red spot of purples reported. Um, it's a uh, just thought it was an interesting way to show that and. Um, I thought it was nice that given our club data is different reports and individuals and skewed, but we had this nice smooth sort of gradation and it all gets plotted like this, which I thought was pretty neat. Uh, and that's all I've got. Um, those, are my, uh, those are my plots. <laughs> Don't disappear. We've got a couple minutes to uh, pepper them both with questions if you have any, but uh, we're going to pack up pretty quickly. Uh, um, any questions for the speaker? Including yeah. Brian. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, with some of these, a lot of these butterflies in the last two years, the you know, populations have gone down. Uh -huh. uh, did you take into consideration like 10 years ago when we had a severe drought and there were not many flowers? And last year, July and August, it just rained all the time. Um, I took nothing into account. The data is the data. I plotted it. I mean, that would, that would be reasons why. Yeah, that yeah, would be. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's definitely true. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not clear with what you're looking at because you're looking at existing data. Is that your deliverable? Um, so I made these plots for the purpose of having something to present. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, um, I'm wondering what the is your plan or the next steps? What do you envision happening? Um, so there's two things that I'm doing, and it's in conjunction with Gary, and I'm making distribution charts like these for the atlas, where you can actually look and see where in the state it's been reported in the past. Um, so there'll be maps that can be part of that and written into those account descriptions for the species. I'm also doing flight charts with the data as well. So you can tell what time of year they fly, updating Eric's work from 2014. Okay, so then the question is, are you asking for some kind of systematic assessment or sensing going forward? I don't think I've heard that. Because when, for example, you talk about three-year maps, you've got the state divided into quadrants, you've got assigned territories, you have people looking, you have a five-year plan, whatever. I don't hear any of that other than go out and look for butterflies. Is the truth in that you're just going to keep working on what we gather as flood data? Okay, so there's no attempt to say, okay, this area doesn't have coverage, someone will go over there. Well, it could be a Right. And what I was asking was if there was any organization or coverage or systematic work around expanding the data set. Okay. Are you kind of asking? People to uh, submit the reports when they go out. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So you are you going to present 